to be here and um, it's also I really appreciate the fact that everyone has caffeinated and so many people have come back and sat down for this panel in the middle of the afternoon. Um, we have a great group of people here, three of whom were last minute additions. Um, ambassadors um, Bremer, Wolfowitz, and Khalilzad, and also the Iraqi ambassador to the U.S., um, all had to drop out with last-minute engagements. So um, I will introduce the panel, um, essentially in chronological order of involvement, they've just pointed out. Uh, we have Dr. Stephen Cambone at the far end. He served from 2001 to 2006 in the Department of Defense. During that time, he was twice nominated by President Bush and confirmed by the Senate for senior positions. I used to do this for a living. Well, everyone can still hear me. Um, including um, the, as the first Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. Second, we have Ambassador John Negroponte. He's been ambassador to Honduras, Mexico, the Philippines, the United Nations, and he was the first ambassador to Iraq. He was also the first director of national intelligence under President Bush, as you've uh, seen him talking about on another panel. So thank you for a second appearance. Uh, number three, we have Ambassador Chris Hill. He was ambassador to Iraq from 2009 to 2010, and earlier served as ambassador to Korea and Macedonia, and was special envoy to Kosovo. He is now dean at the University of Denver's Joseph Corbel School of International Studies. And finally, we have Ambassador James Jeffrey. He was ambassador in Iraq um, until about three weeks ago, 2010 till then. He also had multiple tours there, serving as a senior advisor for Iraq from 05 to 06, with a brief stint as charge d'affaires during that time, and then came back again as deputy chief of mission from 2004 to 2005. So, now that I've got everyone's bona fides established, I would like to set out the purpose of this panel as a chance to look back, ask some tough questions, get some things on the record that you might not have heard before. In our conversations over the past couple of days, I've heard some things that I had not heard before. It's also a chance to look ahead and ask how post-war Iraq is playing a role from serving as a possible Al-Qaeda safe haven that never existed before to setting a more positive example as a working democracy in a sea of conflicted areas. I'm gonna kick off with about 15 minutes. We're gonna talk about the history, how we got into the war. And I want to start with some bullet points, things that we pretty much um, all agree we got wrong. The intelligence, which was cited as one of the major reasons for invading. Um, bringing in so few troops, which uh, resulted in a great deal of unrest directly after the invasion. The post-war plan, which seemed to change every three to six months. Uh, the debathification program and the dismantling of the um, Iraqi army, which produced a ready-made batch of trained officers who knew how to build bombs and had nothing else to do with their time since they couldn't get jobs except go out and attack U.S. troops. And also, why was the CIA and the U.S. military's analysis that an insurgency had started ignored for so long back in Washington? So, um, tough questions. I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Kembo. We were talking about the intelligence. Mm -hmm. Was curveball the main reason we got into Iraq and Tell us what you think in retrospect about how we acted on that. Hmm. Well, uh, I'm not sure everybody here knows who or what Curveball may have been. Which is exactly why I'm leaving it to you to explain. Um, but he, he was a, uh, a source that had, uh, as I recall, come out of Iraq, who had been debriefed uh, sometime prior to, uh, to the outbreak of the war. And, and he uh, claimed to have firsthand knowledge of the WM, some WMD programs in Iraq. Uh, there's a great deal of um, discussion about his debriefing. Uh, there are other people here in the audience who probably are more uh, uh, knowledgeable about the specific details of his debrief. But, but a short answer to your question is no, I don't think it, it was the decision or the intelligence turned on Curveball, who subsequently, by the way, was found to be a fabricator and whose information was uh, subsequently uh, proven to be false. Um, 
I don't think it turned on that. I think it, uh, it turned primarily on the preponderance of the evidence. It turned on the, uh, the circumstances in which we found ourselves at the time, uh, the extent to which proliferation was an ongoing concern, uh, the behavior of the uh, Saddam Hussein's regime at the time. It's, it's forgotten that there was an active uh, military operation in both northern and southern Iraq. Uh, where there were constant provocations of the no-fly zones uh, as a result of the first Iraq war. Uh, the fact that since that war, uh, in its immediate aftermath, that is the first one he used, uh, Hussein did, um, weapons of mass destruction on his own people, there was a preponderance of evidence that led one to believe um, that it was reasonable to suppose that there was, in fact, uh, weapons of mass destruction um, in, in that country. So I think Kerbal turns out to be sort of the the eyes on that sort of, sort of con you know, leads everybody to conclude that the, what we thought we knew was, was probably right. A mistake to draw that conclusion. Uh, was it a mistake to draw that conclusion? Well, that's a, that's a more difficult thing to say. The, the, the conclusion was mistaken. To draw the conclusion might not have been a mistake. Because in the end, and again, I mean, uh, you know, there are enough friends here in the intelligence community who understand this. I mean, you only know what you know at the time and you have to fill in the rest. So was it reasonable to draw that judgment at the time? I, I think the answer is, based on what people, the judgment they did draw, that yeah, it probably was. In retrospect, was it accurate? No. Now, I have heard from some special operations teams that came in ahead of the invasion force, dropped in on some of the sites. They thought they were dropping in onto a nuclear weapons site. And they found a sort of Potemkin village situation, air ducts that weren't really air ducts, but it looked like a facility from the air. Was this a PSYOP campaign by Saddam that meant to scare the regional um, countries that went wrong, blew up yeah, in the space? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, if you, uh, I mean, Charlie Dolfer, uh, who, who did the second look at the, uh, at the program inside Iraq, I think Charlie drew the conclusion that it, it could have been a real program had he intended it to be a real program. Uh, he had the means of doing it, uh, but they weren't, they weren't there. Now, as, as a point of fact, um, some of you may remember the Iraq survey group. Uh, uh, I was instrumental in having that group put together in the belief that we would find in that country weapons of mass destruction, scientists who were engaged in those programs, uh, and the like. So we took it quite seriously. We sent people across the, the, the berm uh, in their full mop gear expecting to engage. Um, in, in chemical or biological weapons attacks. So it, th this wasn't a kind of um, uh, trumped up notion that, that there were uh, capabilities there. There was a belief that there was, and, and we conducted ourselves accordingly. Ambassador Hill, you were part of some of the discussions in the run-up to the war. Do you care to share any of those with us? You know, I'd like to take a wider aperture of it. I, I don't think it was about just about intelligence. I think that was part of the issue, the interpretation of the intelligence, the fact that we had sensors really turned up in the wake of 9-11. Uh, we were listening to a lot of different things, and so the question was how you interpreted the things that you were listening to. But I think it was a, uh, the decision was a much, it was based on a broader concept of we have this guy, Saddam Hussein, uh, in this critical country. He uh, had a uh, reputation uh, for, you know, for murdering people en masse. I mean, anyone who's been to Iraq for five minutes and can see what this person did. I mean, I went up to Halapsha where he had uh, uh, used gas against the Kurds. So, I mean, there, there was a real compelling reason why you'd want to go after this guy. Um, and so, and also in the, in the wake of 9-11, I mean, the mood was we can't let people like that stay out there. So the real issue, uh, I think, ultimately is, you know, I saw a number that it cost us $1.8 trillion, and I think you can ask the question from that perspective is, was it the right thing to do? But I, you know, when you're there, when you look at some of these just heinous uh, operations that Saddam had, you do have a sense that, okay, we're doing the right thing, and maybe some things went awry, but it was kind of the right thing to do. And I. And you know, in this current mood in our country where we look at these kinds of things now and we say, my God, what, was, what possessed us to do this? You know, you have to be careful about presentism. You have to think about what the mood was at the time. And he was a, uh, Saddam Hussein was a person who, you know, I think 
arguably in the wake of the mood after 9-11 was someone we wanted to take off the board. Yet arguably it also took our attention away from Afghanistan, a still hot war, and took a number of troops and resources from it. Yeah, and I certainly understand that argument. I think people who are involved in those decisions can talk about that. But I, I really think, you know, whether Iraq is ever, is always going to be called the Iraq War as opposed to the Republic of Iraq is going to depend on the future, what happens in Iraq, how it, uh, how our policy goes forth with Iraq. You know, right now we have a very dicey situation there. I mean, it is the object of a great game among Sunni Arab states who want to restore Sunni rule and, uh, and the Iranians who want to keep it as a, the, the only Shia Arab state. I mean, this is, this is really the issue. And uh, we jumped into it, and so I think we have a responsibility to kind of stay engaged and I don't think that involves asking second lieutenants with ruck uh, sacks to be uh, negotiating with sheikhs. I think it's uh, kind of up to uh, diplomats to start doing that. Okay, well, before we get to that, okay. let's get back to we decided to invade. Um, the number of troops we chose, uh, the plan, does the U.S. just not understand how to occupy a place? Is it something, uh, knowledge we'd lost? Well, I, what I would say to that, well, first of all, on the question of curveball and, and intelligence failures, I mean, it was a notor it turned out to be a notorious enough mistake to cause the revamping, the reform of the intelligence community. We talked a bit about that yesterday, so I don't think anybody, uh, you know, questions that that was a serious mistake. Uh, on the question of uh, you take the invasion as a given, then you have the issue of whether there were enough forces. And I think this is fairly characteristic of the way we get involved in some of these conflicts. I, uh, two of us here are veterans of uh, the Vietnam uh, conflict in one form or another. And, and there we made a huge error of judgment in terms of how long it would take. I can remember a, a, a sector advisor in Vietnam before we sent combat troops there. He was answering a question from my deputy ambassador there. Uh, how many troops would you need to clean up your province? And he said, oh, one battalion could clean this place up in about three weeks. Well, you know, nine years and two Korean divisions later in that very same province gives you some sense of how sometimes we uh, subject ourselves to wishful thinking. I think that's exactly what happened in Iraq. There may have been some errors in terms of the way we handled the uh, bathification and so forth, but when I got there in June of 2004, it was clear to me that the term reconstruction, and we had a $17 billion reconstruction fund, was a misnomer. And it was all for water, electricity, uh, irrigation, and what have you. And uh, I had to recommend to Washington that we reprogram several billion dollars for building the, uh, Af uh, the uh, Iraqi police and military forces. So one last point, and again, I see this pattern from Vietnam uh, through to Iraq and Afghanistan. We never, in each of those cases, early enough got committed to the idea of building local capacity. It always came too late. Mm -hmm. And I think as a result, we, uh, it, it cost us casualties, it cost us lives, and it uh, prolonged the time, when it, the day when we would be able to uh, exit our own forces. So, so Kim, mm. a, a thought on that. Um, I, don't disagree with the ambassador at all, but on the issue of how many troops were committed and when they were committed, th th there's a, a part of the story that is, is not, either not well known or not well commented on, which is the plan did call for another division to come in through Turkey into the north and to come down toward Baghdad. That division did not come in until much later. Um, had it come in earlier, the 173rd wouldn't have been moved from Aviano in Italy to, in, in essence, buffer between the Kurds and the Sunnis. And Ray Odierno was the man who had the, the division at the time. He would have come in with the rest of the force. And, and it's my belief that the political situation as a result would have been profoundly different because we would not have had then the 4th ID conducting the operations it would have conducted prior to May in the aftermath in 03, and thereby change the political attitudes and circumstances at the time. What drove that decision? Um, we failed to get the approval of the Turks to move the forces through. 
that was a diplomatic issue, not a DOD issue. DOD asked, but we couldn't get there. Uh, for whatever reason, the Turks weren't, weren't willing to do that, and, and the others here may know more about the specifics of it. But, but it's an important strategic shortcoming right, that happened prior to the outbreak of hostilities. And, and so as we go through and sort of think about lessons, right, it is important that, that all of the parts be aligned right, and, and, and understand that you're taking risks if you go forward without having done it properly. But General Shinseki had also called for far more troops than just one extra division. And that no, that's general. fair enough. But, but again, you know, the combat operations and then the aftermath, right, um, you know, were two different sets of circumstances. And so, you know, you really want to poke on the plan and whether there was a plan for reconstruction and all the rest. You know, th there was. Um, so where was the miscalculation? The miscalculation, in my view, was, was on just, this is why I'm coming back to the troops coming in from the north, on what the political circumstances were going to be and how long it was going to take to take Saddam out of the picture and what the reaction of the local populations were going to be. Right? And, and the, they didn't, in the end, mesh. But that doesn't mean there wasn't a plan and there wasn't people who were intending to do it. Now, let's talk about reaction times on the ground to, you find out things on the ground like, okay, the Iraqi people are not reacting as we expected. The infrastructure is not what we expected to find from the satellite images from the air. Um, you all, especially um, the three ambassadors sitting here, sent reports back to DC various times, especially Ambassador Negroponte, um, Ambassador Jeffrey. What was the response when you told folks in the Pentagon we're seeing an insurgency. We're seeing signs that this is running away from us. What are you doing? Uh, well, <laughs> I was working for John. So uh, we very early uh, saw that we not only were faced with uh, a considerable amount of violence, but that we didn't even have control of the famous um, road between uh, the airport and um, <clears throat> Uh, the embassy in the green zone, and that we were uh, not focused on what we later came to focus on, and frankly what we focused on earlier in Vietnam, which is protecting the population that was not a part of the mission set. The uh, answer was to stand up the Iraqi army. I won't get into the painful details that led to John very quickly deciding that billions of dollars had to be shifted from long-range projects into supporting Dave Petraeus <clears throat> directly in uh, funding the police and the armed forces or indirectly through SERP programs, short-term um, in the field kind of uh, uh, development assistance to get people back to work and such because we realized we had a tremendous problem. Uh, we were passing that information on to Washington. The solution was uh, basically stand up the Iraqi army and they will be able to take over the job. The problem was the Iraqi army uh, was not easy to stand up. It took a good many years and a lot of fighting to do that. And in the meantime, the insurgency <clears throat> established itself. Established itself, and then, of course, in 2006, it really blew up. I now, think it's important also to understand that the insurgency wasn't a matter of Ba'athists or just uh, Iraqi army unhappy with debathification or the decommissioning of the army. It was a Sunni it was a Sunni insurgency. So why was it a Sunni insurgency? And the reason was debathification was considered on the ground to be a kind of desunification. It was sort of we were accepting the notion that with democracy would come Shia majority rule, and yes, there'd be Sunnis invited to participate. But the inst the institutions that kept Sunni rule in place namely the Ba'athist party, we went after. And no one saw it as debathification, they saw it as desunification, hence the Sunni insurgency. But I would have, I agree totally with uh, Chris, but I would have said, taken it one step further, the very focus of what we were doing in there, which was to not only take down Saddam, but to leave the country in the hands of its population, which is 80% non-Sunni, uh, Shia, Arab, and the Kurd, uh, meant that these guys were going to be out of power, out of the position that they'd had since the Ottoman period, and so to one or another extent, it was likely that they were going to react violently. Could I just say, I mean, th this is a sort of an agonizing discussion. Let me try to put it in about three sentences. Instead of a successful invasion with a quick result and installing painlessly a new Iraqi government, we found that instead we had to go through a one-year occupation, 
billions and billions of dollars in building up their police and armed forces, a uh, secular war, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, several elections. But finally, I think we're at where ideally we would have liked to have been in the spring or summer of 2003. And oh. so just by way of illustration of how things can take eight or nine years longer than you think mm -hmm. they might when you plan them. Which, which is the common U.S. military wisdom is that a counterinsurgency takes about a decade. Um, but it's the, the painful part is some of the steps that we missed along the way. I still have to ask, um, the counter, I, I at the time talked to generals, I've spoken to CIA officers whose <coughs> careers were scuppered because they stood up and said, before it was acceptable to say, hey, there's, there's an insurgency building here. And it, so I have to ask Dr. Cambone, what was happening when some of these reports came back to the Pentagon? Uh, uh, they were taken with a great deal of seriousness. I mean, I, I don't know about people's careers who stood up and said they were, they were scuppered because of, of having said so. There, there was a, um, there, as I recall the circumstances we had at the time, we're talking now, this is March through September of 03. Um, there was a good deal of uncertainty as to how all of this was gonna shake itself out. I was there in June of 03. Um, I was there with a congressional delegation, Chuck Alsop, who's here, he was there with me, Senator Warner, Senator Levin, um, Senator Collins, a number of others. Um, and the circumstances at the time uh, did not lend themselves to the conclusion we were headed rapidly in that direction. All right? um, so you get to the fall, and, and there are reports now coming back about insurgency. So the question then becomes, what, what, is, what, what was the implication of its being an insurgency? Right? And as you just went through John's sort of description, this thing moved from being one kind of thing to another thing, to it morphed over time. Right? So that there was opposition in the population is true. That there was a, uh, a center of gravity that was the insurgency in the fall of 03 is a little harder. By the time you get to the turn of the year in 04, it's becoming clearer. By the time you move into the 04 time frame, it, it's, that's where we are, all right? So, so these things don't turn around on a dime. And, and the conversion of the force, and I remember this vividly, uh, starts in August of 03, when the secretary said, why are our people still inside their armored vehicles? Why aren't they on the ground, patrolling the streets and taking care of the violence? And with that began the evolution of the military side of the reaction to what was taking place. I mean, it was, it was a vivid conversation. So are you saying that Secretary Rumsfeld was saying we need a counterinsurgency program on the ground? By, 03, by, by the August of 03, it was clear that this thing was turning in a direction that, that was not anticipated and, and was not planned for in the detail that it eventually <laughs> was by the time we got into 04. Let's get to the next pivot, which will then bring us to some of the big issues that I know you all want to talk about, about Iraq today. Um, the next big pivot was 2006. Um, you had an you had underground um, fight between, you had Al-Qaeda of Iraq trying to trigger a Shiite-Sunni dispute. You had the political backdrop to that was that the two were <laughs> fighting um, over government. We were trying to arbitrate, not very well. And you had the bombing of the Golden Mosque of Samarra, a Shiite shrine, and the decision by General Casey at the time to keep U.S. troops on base and let the nascent Iraqi army try to handle the unrest. Now, I remember what happened over the next month. The Shiite death squad started going out um, seeking revenge and literally a hundred bodies a day started showing up in the streets. Uh, many of them with, you know, people killed by the Shiite tool of choice at the time, which was the power drill. So this was really horrific stuff. Is that something we could have, should have prevented? I, I will would, let anyone jump in. I would say yes, and we could have. How so? Uh, 
We did have a lot of troops there uh, at various points by keeping on troops uh, because of the Najaf uh, fighting in the summer of uh, 2004. Uh, we were up well over 150,000 troops. Uh, and that isn't too far down from where we were at the point of the surge. The question was, did the troops have the mission of going out and securing the population? During my time there and during my time working uh, from, uh, in Washington on Iraq from 2005 uh, to, through 2006 and then uh, less intensively through 2007 until the surge began, uh, I didn't see that, uh, that clear mission to protect the population. Um, and yet, there was also the argument being made um, by General Casey at the time, by the Iraqis that I spoke to, you know, get out of our face, get off our streets, you're more of an irritant. So I know that that was driving their decision making. I mean, at, at what point um, does having a U.S. patrol in your street all the time trigger more violence? I mean, what do you all think of that? Did you think of that argument at the time? And you're looking at us. I was not, uh, I was back in Washington at the time, and I recall not so much what the marching orders of our military was as much as the despair, the sense of despair that was felt in Washington from the president on down in terms of this sectarian violence. I think he saw the whole, the whole project, the whole effort uh, going down the drain, really. And that's when he uh, commissioned a group, a very small group of people, uh, led by his de deputy national security advisor, to come up and spend several months. And there's some people in this room who were involved in various parts of that effort to uh, think about what it was we could do next to uh, try to salvage this situation. And that is when the idea of the surge was. Uh, uh, conjured up and even then I don't think it had much support because uh, the analysts, many of the Iraq analysts were extremely pessimistic and I think felt that there was hardly anything we could do uh, about the situation at that point. Well, I'd just like to say I agree with Jim that we should have and we, we could have done more on the street but I would also make the point that it was a political issue that we did not understand. Uh, the American public was treated to a lot of statements like, these are just like Nazi dead-enders in, uh, in Bavaria. This was not about party dead-enders. This was a sectarian uh, problem, and I think we're a little slow to, to catch on to that and, and slow to, to try to forge a, uh, you know, a government that, uh, that involved everybody, uh, that all, involved all the, the entities. Uh, that said, I mean, I think the Shia were in a mood to, uh, for, um, for revenge against uh, the Sunnis, and uh, I think it's a very, very difficult undertaking to ask Americans to do that. And finally, um, I was in, in Iraq when, uh, when the U.S. military pulled out of the towns, the cities and towns, it was part of the... Uh, the uh, SOFA, SOFA agreement when they pulled out uh, June 30th, the status, uh, of forces status of forces agreement when they pulled out in 2009. And I remember Maliki gets up and uh, says something that to me was really uh, kind of hard to take. He was saying, this is a great victory for the Iraqi people. And I thought, you know, how can he say something like that? And then he continued and he said, but with all great victories, it will come with costs. And basically, as he as he completed the speech, I came to understand what he was talking about, which is everyone wants to see the streets return to Iraqi sovereignty, but everyone knew that the Iraqi army is not exactly the world's greatest fighting force, and there are going to be many problems in terms of you know, civilian casualties, and he's just, he was simply getting the population ready for those problems, understanding that they have to endure that if they're going to regain sovereignty. And I remember that moment and thinking, you know, this issue of sovereignty is, is huge for Iraqis. It's really been the glue to keep that very fractious country together. And I think the fact that we tried this one-year occupation, as John suggests, probably as we look back and, you know, we were looking at it somehow in the optic of, you know, Nazi Germany 1945, it's probably the wrong way to think of the place. To pick up on Chris, there was uh, actually two insurgencies, and they were quite different. 
uh, the Sunni one with uh, the uh, dollop of al-Qaeda coming in on top of it, and the Shia one led by Muqtadar al-Sadr, although at various times other groups were involved too. Some of that was supported at various times by Iran, which is a whole separate subject, but much of it was uh, basically bubbling up from below. Essentially, whenever you go into a country, regardless of uh, how good your motives, regardless of how important and necessary, you are going to generate very violent reactions. Yeah, these reactions are going to be stronger if you're out on the street throwing water bottles at people, but they're going to be there even if you're uh, ensconced in bases around the country. Uh, this is the history of Iraq, it's the history of Turkey, it's the history of any other country. And uh, Muqtada al Assad exploited that clearly uh, uh, very selfishly because he saw that this was a way to build up his own political capital because that had resonance among the population. So at various times we were fighting both in the Sunni areas and we were fighting down in Najaf or in Sada City. Let's talk about the surge. Um, now prior to the surge uh, there was a year of concentrated intelligence-led special operations um, actions against uh, Al-Qaeda, against Sadrists, and a whole lot of actors got taken off the stage and then the surge came in. Do you think the surge worked or do you think it was the year of special operations actions before that? What do you think turned things around? Do you think it turned around? Sure. Yes. Um, no military operation succeeds without there having been um, some amount of preparation going forward. Uh, so the work that was done by uh, General Casey and others during that course of that year uh, was significant. Um, you know, the sons of, uh, of Iraq, the Arab awakening, what was it, out in Anbar, it's terribly important. And, and that had been underway for some time. Uh, those folks finally figured out that this Al Qaeda thing was not working for them uh, and that they would be better off uh, coming to terms at least with the U.S. military. There remained the political reconciliation, but at least with the U.S. military. And the strikes that you're talking about uh, certainly did have uh, a way of, uh, in military terms, setting the conditions uh, on which the surge forces fell um, in, uh, in late, uh, what was it, 06 and in 07. Um, my view is that they gave the final muscle, the final push, the final cement to allow the things that, the exhaustion that had begun to overtake the parties, it allowed them to kind of back up, reconvene, and, and find a way now to come to terms with one another in the face of what was a significant strategic and political decision by the president at no small risk to say we are going to do the surge. He was the principal supporter of the surge. There's no question about it. Um, and, and he drove that. Right? So that was a, uh, in my view, a courageous but absolutely essential strategic decision which then played itself out. I mean, the gentleman here had a lot to do with that. But, but the president took that decision and, and pushed it forward. But I do believe that that prior year <coughs> meant an awful lot. Well, Ambassador Hill. You, you were also, you saw the end of the surge, the, saw the benefits of it. Did it work when you were there? Oh, I think it clearly worked, but I would just be careful how you define surge. I think you really have to disaggregate it. And uh, the reason I say that is I think we need to be careful that whenever we're in some messy situation, we say, oh, we need a surge here, like it's some uh, uh, thing that will fix every problem. Uh, it doesn't, and uh, in the case of Iraq, the surge, and I'm very pleased that you have talked about General Casey's role before this all was known as the surge, because there was an awful lot of work, and especially work within the Sunni community. We could see that the uh, Al Qaeda and others who were really overplaying their hands, we, uh, our troops went in, worked with local sheikhs, <laughs> I mean, used money as a weapon of war. It, this isn't very elegant at times, but you simply say, Sheikh, I will give you this money if your people stop shooting at us. If they don't stop shooting at us, I will not give you this money. This kind of stuff was going on, and these were initiatives done by 22-year-old Americans. Truly impressive. So I, I think one has to be a little careful about talking about these sort of cosmically big issues about surge, when really what we were finding is our well-trained, extremely well-trained troops were learning lessons on the ground and how to apply them. And finally, um, uh, Jim has very correctly talked about the Shia issue. 
but it was Malachi who said, I've had enough of these, uh, an, enough of these uh, uh, Shia um, uh, groups in, in, in Basra. Our people were telling Malachi, don't do that. And in fact, Malachi went in there, he got in, he got in trouble, he was over his head, uh, and so we had to bring in troops. And the next thing you know, you, you hear uh, backgrounders going to the U.S. press, actually Malachi was in trouble, but fortunately, you know, good thing we were there. Malachi took a tough decision, created all kinds of problems within the, within the Shia, so much so he had real troubles putting together a Shia coalition because he participated in a very key way in the surge. Um, and so I would just be careful looking at surge simply in terms of uh, seize, hold, uh, build, uh, transfer. There's a lot more going on, and I'd be especially careful about using it as a solution for other problems in other countries. And then just by way of addition to that, it seems to me that it's the surge plus the fact that you do then have an Iraqi government that is starting to evolve yeah. into a credible uh, political entity, both through uh, building up its security forces and having gone through a process of a couple of elections and, and apropos of Mr. Maliki, a prime minister who ends up demonstrating that he has quite impressive uh, political durability. Um, such durability that, and such confidence in his rule that he says no to another status of forces agreement with the U.S. So, well, I, let me jump in okay. on that one because I think we've been a little bit unfair on that issue. I, and it's a subject I discussed with President Bush uh, several times when I was Deputy Secretary of State. Ideally, in Vietnam, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, we would want to have a residual force in a country. You can leave them behind for support, intelligence, uh, what have you. The kind of obvious things you can do that are sort of force multipliers for the local uh, forces. That's what we wanted in Iraq. Mr. Maliki said no. He didn't want any single U.S. troop left behind. George Bush had a difficult decision. Do I insist on what I really want? Or do I run the risk of a Democrat winning the next election who is an inveterate opponent of the war and just deciding that we're going to withdraw from Iraq immediately? So what he decided, he chose what I think he considered to be the lesser of two evils, a status of forces agreement that provided for our complete withdrawal, but by a date that was far enough along so that at least our withdrawal would be orderly. But I think it is not right to suggest that it's this administration that did not succeed in leaving or arranging for a residual force to stay behind. We did make rear guard efforts to accomplish that, but let's be honest, George Bush is the man who agreed to that. And, and yet we did plan to have up to 5,000 troops, mostly special operations forces, on the ground, continuing to work with Iraqi forces, hunting al-Qaeda, keeping Iraq stable. Um, Ambassador Jeffrey, you, sure. you were there trying to negotiate sure. this. But let me give some background in, first of all, not only agree with, but pick up on where John left off. Uh, it was very clear that part of the deal was we would withdraw all of our troops. Again, in the context of 2008, they were a big issue, and the Iraqis wanted to see uh, their sovereignty uh, manifest on the streets and in the bases. What changed uh, between 2008 and 2011 is, first of all, now, the Iraqis could see that we were going to live up to our commitments. After we pulled out of the cities, and then after, in 2010, uh, it was one uh, tweak that the Obama administration made on the 2008 uh, uh, troop presence slash SOFA agreement was to uh, end the combat mission, because by and large, all the fighting, to the extent there was any fighting, was being done by the Iraqis. Uh, the Iraqis could see that we were on a, a path to pull essentially all of our combat troops out. So then the question was, it's not such a big thing if we still have some American troops left, because there was no doubt um, they had already uh, purchased soon over $10 billion of FMS. Uh, they were engaged in us in many military and intelligence uh, operations and activities, and it was obviously of interest to them to keep on uh, uh, some kind of American security presence because of the residual threat from al-Qaeda, the possibility 
of the Shia militias again. And uh, Maliki was interested in this, as was the Obama administration. The idea was uh, there were various numbers bandied about, but 5,000, including both trainers, special forces, intelligence, and a lot of uh, administrative staff, uh, was the figure that we were basically focused on. The problem was not in the troop presence. Maliki said, I need political cover because a status of forces agreement under the Iraqi uh, scheme of things had to go to the parliament, so I'm going to need all of the other political parties, or at least most of them, to support me. Uh, between the time that we actually laid out the plan in detail to him in June and October, uh, there were three major meetings of all of the parties, including the Sadrists. Uh, in the end, all but the Sadrists agreed to have a U.S. military presence. What they disagreed on was to give the Americans legal immunities, uh, which is the key ingredient of any SOFA. For very good reasons that are global and longstanding for the United States, we can't put troops overseas without uh, those kind of legal immunities. On the other hand, the Iraqis, while they wanted the troops and they wanted what the troops would do, uh, said, we're happy to have the troops, but we uh, can't give you the immunities. Just stay on the bases and stay out of trouble and everything will be okay. And so we could not square that. So at the end of the day, we decided that we would go with a more traditional <clears throat> approach as we'd have done in Saudi Arabia and uh, in other countries without a combat troop, uh, basically a combatant commander's forces on the ground, but rather a large security assistance office, very large diplomatic and intelligence sharing and other things to try to do most of the training, equipping, uh, counterterrorism, other operations without the troop presence. So that's how that rolled out. But it has been posited by many in the GOP that the Obama administration planned this, that they didn't really want the SOFA to work, that they sabotaged it. Uh, I talked to President Obama twice and, I'm, and uh, Vice President Biden innumerable times, and they very much wanted to have a residual force, I shouldn't say force, residual presence of American troops doing training, uh, counterterrorism, and other such activities. And the reason is, and we can get to this in a second, they could see that this was a success. This was something that kind of unexpectedly came out of the blue, was something that uh, made America, made th uh, their administration, and made the last administration all look good. They didn't want to risk anything if it was doable. I have, it, the, same the conversations. The I have the same conversations mm -hmm. with Vice President Biden and President Obama. They did want to make it a success, and they did want to see uh, an extension of the SOFA. So the war is over. Let's get to some of the aftermath questions, starting with Al-Qaeda. There wasn't an al-Qaeda presence in Iraq prior to the U.S. invasion. Right now, the most recent U.S. intelligence estimates that I had is that the al-Qaeda presence is around 1,000 fighters. It's one of the largest al-Qaeda branches. Uh, possibly Yemen's ahead now, but it's large, it's dangerous. The al-Qaeda spokesman over the weekend talked about reviving the organization to full strength um, in Iraq. And we've seen a rash of calculated coordinated, sophisticated bombings. Have we produced something that's going to be with us for some time? Uh, let me it, take that. Uh, the Al-Qaeda threat was huge back in 2005, 2006, 2007. It subsequently dropped and dropped and dropped to uh, a pattern that was uh, manifest when I arrived in uh, August of 2010, in fact, right after I arrived, there was a horrible series of attacks around the country, bigger than the ones last week that were all al-Qaeda's. Uh, since that time, uh, again, they were under continuing pressure, both from uh, our special operations, our intelligence uh, multipliers, and uh, the Iraqi forces who were quite good in counterterrorism, and the attacks dropped further. Uh, but still, about once a month, you would get this series of attacks throughout the country. And uh, people thought that they saw a spike back in early 2012. We looked at it carefully. I don't really think it was much of a spike. Now, what happened last week is somewhat different. That is a somewhat larger uh, uh, set of attacks with somewhat more casualties. Again, nothing very surprising compared to even 2010, let alone 2008 or 2006, but it's something you have to watch. Politically, however, the polls we've seen, uh, the political branch, such as it is of al-Qaeda, has zero, literally zero support in polling among the Sunnis of Iraq. So that they have, uh, basically through uh, criminal activities, a base of sorts in Mosul, which is the only place where they actually operate with, any, with limited impunity. And apart from that, they have a very uh, skilled capability of infiltrating suicide bombers and explosives throughout the country. And they're going to continue to have that. The political impact of that, however, 
right now is not very high. It has to be watched, however, because once before it was able to expand and have a considerable political as well as military impact. They are not holding territory. I mean, they're not holding territories. We're, we're not seeing sort of Fallujah go under uh, al-Qaeda uh, uh, command. So it is a kind of different situation. But I think it does reflect what is going on in the region. Uh, and probably some countries that were more helpful in terms of combating flows, uh, um, either foreign fighter flows or financial flows, are prob probably have other priorities right now. And so I think it is, to some extent, one of those uh, externalities of the, uh, of the Arab Spring or the Arab thing, whatever we're calling it. But uh, uh, I think it's, it's pretty clear. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, we're, it's pretty clear that with America gone, or the perception that somehow with our troops gone, that there's a sense among some peoples, including this extreme uh, radical uh, Sunni, that somehow the country is once again up for grabs. Dr. Cambone, when you look back at that and think the invasion was about making the U.S. safer, and yet you've got this large al-Qaeda presence that, while it might not be holding territory, could present a transnational threat. Yes. So does it, um, is it one of those things that I guess we'll, okay, we'll get to, uh, we'll get to the, the next question about um, the positives and the negatives. Yeah. Yeah, look, it, it, sure. I mean, that, and, I, and I think Chris gave you a, a, a fairly reasonable answer as to why those things occur. Um, and, and they were not eradicated in the intervening period. There were people who survived. Uh, there are others who have, uh, have infiltrated back in. Um, is it possible now for recruits to be drawn from that population to other places? Yes. Um, so is, is there a continuing underlying turmoil in the region? Yes. So what does that point to? It really points to uh, the need for the United States to make plain, plainer, um, its intention with respect to the security of the region, its determination to stay a critical member of sustaining security in the region, to do it visibly, right? and, but not in a way uh, necessarily that is going to result then in the reactions that one gets uh, when one overplays the hand. Okay? So a lesson learned. Right, is, is one of those. Right? And, and the administration, for its part, has, has done a number of those kinds of things. So the, the talk about the deployment of uh, Patriot missiles, the reorganization of the Fifth Fleet, uh, visits into various ports. Right? I mean, there's a number of those things that have taken place as they've been trying to send the message that, yes, while there, there is not a, a large U.S. military presence inside of Iraq, the United States has not lost its interest in the region, and it is going to continue to play a leading role in the security of that, that part of the world. Let me bring it back to the final question that I had for all of you that we talked about earlier um, before we open it up to the floor. We lost about 4,500 American troops. A uh, new federal study says we lost about 719 contractors, half of them Americans. Um, is estimates of Iraqi war dead range up to 100,000 people. Um, what did we learn? Who wants to start? They were much more talkative earlier today. Okay, I'll start. Um, first of all, we learned that we can succeed. Iraq is a success today for American foreign policy and particularly American uh, military might. It was a very difficult success. It's very precarious. I say this all the time, but every morning the first thing I do is click on the uh, Iraq news uh, uh, to see if uh, uh, I have to modify what I say because this is uh, still very precarious. It faces the underlying fissures that we all know about between Kurds, uh, Sunni Arabs, and Shia Arabs. As Chris said, you've got uh, uh, interference by the Sunni Arab states by Iran and uh, a great deal of activity by the Turks, particularly in the north, but not just there. So that requires a lot of uh, exactly what Steve Cambone said, American engagement in the region. But sitting on top of an embassy of 16,000 people and $6 billion, I certainly didn't feel lonely or felt that America had abandoned me out there. So it's a success, but it's a very limited success. Uh, what we learned is these things are very, very hard. 
uh, was of choice are very, very difficult. They have a huge, typically negative impact on the population. Some, at least, of what we see in Libya and today in Syria on the part of the administration has to be a reaction to the very negative reaction of the American people at various points to uh, what we were doing and not doing in Iraq. Secondly, uh, and this is a big theme, but I'll just touch on it because it's come up on almost every one of the panels, this idea whether it's counterterrorism or uh, uh, drones or whatever. Right, but in the long run, it's got to be the political, the economic, the reconciliation, the nation building and all of that. We tried that. We put huge amounts of money into it. As John said, he had a $17 billion budget, and we uh, doubled down on that at various points. It's very, very hard, even without a roaring war, even without a big counterinsurgency, to do development assistance, to do long-term nation building to do reconciliation of uh, bitterly opposed political forces. If that's the exit strategy for American troops, we're going to have a lot of trouble. I'll leave it at that. Ambassador Hill. I think um, in invading Iraq, we took on probably the toughest problem there is in the region. It's after all where the, uh, where the Persian world meets the uh, Arab world, where's the, where the Shia world meets the Sunni world, where the Turkic world meets the Arab world. Yeah, I cannot think of a tougher place. And so if you're going to go into the toughest place, don't just do it on adrenaline. Do it by maybe doing a little homework. And I feel that we should have done an awful lot more homework about you know, when you look at a dictator, the first question should not be, how do we get rid of him? The first question would, should be, how'd he get there? And once you figure out how a person like Saddam got there, that will help inform the, the answer to how do you get rid of him? Clearly, Iraq has to be ruled by some combination of those three communities, Sunni, Shia, and, uh, and the, uh, the Kurds. That, that has to be how it works. But, I mean, to go in and to think that debathification was akin to denazification in 1945 as opposed to getting Sunnis out and replacing them by Shia, I don't think we really understood where the fault lines of that society really were. The fault line of dictatorship and democracy was something we understood, uh, and it was, we were right to, to rectify that. But the Sunni-Shia fault line has been there about a thousand years, and usually when you have a fault line that's been there for a thousand years, you might want to pay a little more attention to how you're going to, how you're going to deal with that. So I must say it was a very hard thing. I, I agree with Jim that it is going in the right direction, and I would put myself on the you know, glass uh, half, half full side. And, you know, I know President Bush will take a lot of grief for the rest of history about the invasion of Iraq, but I don't think anyone can say that he didn't have the guts to take on the toughest problem in the, in the Middle East. So I'm, I'm, I hope we can stay with it. I hope the Obama administration will stay with it. I mean, we do have the world's largest uh, embassy, don't we, Jim? I mean, they're, they're still, we've got our Peruvian guards there still and our... Yeah, there. Uh, Ugandans and uh, our uh, Albanian <laughs> gardeners and uh, Bulgarian. Uh, it was a regular Tower of Babel, you know. I'd go in there. I'd, I used some of my Albanian, my Bulgarian, my Macedonian. You know, it was great. Uh, it's it's a very unusual situation, but I don't. You know, at this point, I think we have to kind of stay stay engaged on it. Ambassador Megaponte. Well, I, I certainly agree with everything that's been said. I agree particularly with the idea of staying involved. I think we need to also encourage the other, our other Arab friends to be supportive of Iraq. I know we've been doing that, but it's really a critical, I mean, if you talk about diplomacy, it's one of the most critical diplomatic elements in this whole situation because when we went in and began this project, uh, Iraq was really isolated from from its... Arab neighborhood, and that has started to get better. The last point I would make is, as we watch this situation politically going forward and provided we stay involved, I think we can influence their internal politics, not to the same degree as if you had 100,000 troops there, but we can still, through our interest and levels of support, influence political moderation inside of Iraq. And the really key thing to watch apart from the evolution of their electoral process and the political parties and so forth, is whether their armed forces and their police can become truly national institutions. That's the real metric. Can they become 
national institutions or is it going to become, is the army going to become some kind of a Shia militia, which is what we want to avoid at all costs. Dr. Cambone, you, you shared a pretty grim lesson this morning that you took uh, away well, from there's this. Well, there, there are some grim ones, but, but let, let me give you the, what I think is, is actually a, a, a bright light of this. I, I think the decision to invade Iraq will prove to be historically uh, one of the great strategic decisions of the first half of the 21st century, if it proves not to be the greatest. And it will prove to be the greatest if, as has been said here, we see this through. And, and it will be uh, one of the greatest strategic victories in the United States because if we can take um, and make it a success in Iraq, if we take what I consider to be some of the aftershocks that you see flowing through the region, whether it be in, in Libya or in Egypt or now in, in Syria, and after Syria comes Lebanon and after Lebanon comes Jordan, right, and after those comes Saudi Arabia, this place is in motion in the way that it hasn't been for a century. And we have an opportunity to shape that. Right? And it comes directly as a result of having invaded Iraq. Now, whether you thought that was a good idea or a bad idea, the decision was taken. And now the opportunity in front of us is enormous to reshape that region if we stick with it and see it through all the way to the end. Do you think it was a good thing or a bad thing, the decision? I think, I think history is going to prove that it, it was a success. I didn't ask about history. I, I think it's going to prove to have been a success. Provocative way to open it to questions. Questions from the audience. Oh, just a few. Um, okay, Barton, I'll get to you front and center. Because I was giving you the challenge to get the microphone there. Well, until I asked this question, Steve Cambone was, was a friend and a colleague. In please, prior please, incarnations. please introduce yourself too. <laughs> no, no. So if, if each of you would be willing to, to answer this question. So if Saddam and his sons were still in power and we had not invaded, so we had not gone into Iraq and they were still in power, what would, uh, how, would, how would that have affected us for the last decade and the Arab world? Don't know if we have time for all of you to answer that, but... A counterfactual history, Aaron. That's Aaron Fuller, by the way, uh, former colleague, friend. Uh, counterfactual history is oh, still a friend. Is is, is always tough. Uh, I, you know, I I think my answer is is it comes from what I just said a moment ago. I I think we would have we would have seen the place still locked in a in a stasis that would have been um, relieved only by the natural passing. Right, of, of the various dictators in the region. Um, what's happened is there's been an enormous acceleration, in my view, of, of change as a result. Uh, so I think we would have seen uh, the place still locked down. And it wouldn't have been good for us. That, that was not a good situation for the United States. I'll take a stab. It's too big a question to answer in any detail, but I would say one thing which we haven't focused a lot on. For most of the Iraqi people, that would have been a far worse scenario than us going in despite the 100,000 uh, killed and despite the lousy infrastructure and all the problems because before 2003, the Kurds and the Shia didn't get very much electricity in any case or any other of the services. So I think from the standpoint of the Iraqi people, and I think most Iraqis would, uh, would be of the opinion that it's a damn good thing that Saddam and his ilk went. And now that's why I wish we had the uh, Iraqi ambassador here. Chris? I think, I think we would have had a bloody civil war there by 2012. I think the Kurds would probably be out of there by now. And, you know, when you look at the development of Kurdistan, uh, it really started with a no-fly zone. I mean, it didn't just start in 2003. It, it started, uh, you know, a decade before. So I think, I think Kur Kurdistan... Some people argue it already has one foot out the door. I think if, if Saddam had been left in charge, it would have had two feet out the door. Saddam was in no shape to invade Kurdistan anymore. Uh, he just couldn't do it. And so I think that would be one big difference. And I think the Shia uh, just wouldn't have put up with it much longer. And that's where I think there would be a, a bloody, uh, bloody civil war. Ambassador Nick Bott, do you I, I think everything has been said. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Mark. Hi, I'm Bart Gelman from uh, Time and Princeton. 
Uh, for purposes of uh, provocation, uh, I'd I, I sharpen the question and ask it in a way that I think only so far Dr. Cambone has answered, which is, uh, let's stipulate that Saddam was a bad guy, uh, that uh, he was hostile to U.S. interests, that uh, the present government is, uh, is better both for Iraqis and for American uh, interests in the region. Uh, with the full benefit of hindsight, if you walked into the souk and someone offered to sell you that change uh, for the, you know, closer to two billion than one billion and the 5,000 and the 100,000, the strains on the U.S. Uh, uh, military forces, the uh, destruction of Iran's principal regional military ally, the propaganda value for al-Qaeda and so on, uh, would you lay your credit card down? Would you, would you now do it again? Sorry, who pays the credit card? I mean, <laughs> I mean I, are you asking if it was worth it? Yeah. I, uh, my view is it was definitely worth it to the Iraqis. And I think from the point of view of the US, it's a very different question for some of the reasons you enumerate. Do you think it was worth it? You know, I, I have opinions about that, and I've kept them to myself uh, through the whole time I was there, and I think I'll keep that up. I'm not interested in sharing my here. opinion on whether it was worth it. Uh. But I think it's an, it's an important point. I mean, we, we haven't yeah. talked much about what the Iraqis think, but I didn't meet many Iraqis who told me, oh, we wish you hadn't overthrown the guy. And I think Steve points to some of the huge opportunities ahead. We haven't talked about the economic opportunities. I mean, if this country starts producing six, seven, eight million barrels of oil a day. It has a more Western orientation than it used to have. I mean, before it was in this stasis that Steve was describing, but, it was, but its big friend at the time from out of the outside powers was, was, was Russia, if I remember correctly. And uh, where is that going to get you? So uh, in that sense, I think uh, a lot has been unblocked that... Uh, uh, that might not have been otherwise. I mean, the last before the invasion, we were we were administering at the UN the oil for food program. That was our relationship with Iraq. And not well. Yeah. You know, Churchill was asked that question: Would you live your life over again, knowing what you know now? And and he said, if I didn't, it would have been my life. So you don't really get a chance to uh, to know the outcome before you start. So when you say, knowing what you know now, would you do now what you did then, you know, it begins to sound like a country song. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, you, you can't. All you can... No, no, that's, that's a different point. And, and so, I, so, yes, I, I'd accept that as, as, as a question. And, but, but given what we knew at the time and what we thought we knew at the time, and the circumstances under which the decisions were taken, I, I think they are justifiable and defensible. And as I said earlier, will turn out to have been one of the great strategic decisions of the, of the 21st century, the first half of the century. And if, we, and if we follow through, it will be a great strategic victory for the United States, not just for the, the people of Iraq. I'll take a stab at that. Uh, having spent three years there uh, trying to help push it in the right direction, uh, we should be very, very, very careful about going into a country and deciding we are going to get rid of one political system and introduce a new one, bearing in mind, I don't think we had a very good idea of what that new one was. We were inventing that as we went along. Wouldn't you say that's fair, John? Yeah. And, Chris? And, uh, and we kept trying, and then we tried something different, and uh, it did work out. Steve is right, but as I said, it's very, very contingent. It may not in the end work out, and we have very little, despite all of the effort we're continuing to put into it, and it's worthwhile and important effort, we have very little control compared to all of the other actors there, whether it in the end will work out all right. So uh, I would say this is a cautionary lesson about that, even if it works out well. And if it doesn't work out well, you know the answer to the question. But at a lower level, let's say, now you're asking the cosmic question, but I think at the level one below that as to how to do these kinds of things if you find yourself again in these kinds of situations. I think we've maybe relearned a number of lessons of history. Uh, patience, be careful before, look before you leap. Uh, nation building is not that easy to do. And I, for me, for me, the biggest lesson in that category really is right from the beginning, you gotta work 
on building up local capacity. And we, we very, I mean, I remember in Vietnam, West, General Westmoreland wanted us to do all the fighting and he avoided the whole issue of Vietnamization for four years. And it wasn't until Creighton Abrams took over uh, that, uh, that we, we began the Vietnamization process. And of course, by then we had sapped the political will of the American people for an enthusiasm for the enterprise. So think about local capacity when you contemplate these kinds of adventures. You know, one of the great ironies of, of the way the war unfolded, uh, and now speaking from the perspective of having listened to the Secretary and of Defense and the arguments that he and Doug and Paul and others made, um, the desire was to in fact rely more on local capacity, to indeed build up the force sooner, not to engage in an occupation because uh, some of you heard the, pres the Secretary's speech about the bone and you know, you break your bone and, and you uh, rely on the splint and it doesn't heal and all the rest. So, you know, he, he was desirous of, of not so much uh, trying to do this on the cheap, which is frequently the, the uh, criticism. He was looking to do it in a way that would have aligned the peace parts such that the amount of time that the United States remained deeply engaged was foreshortened by the speed with which local capacity could be brought up. Now, it is fair to say that the training that was supposed to have taken place, the, the electric grid being stood back up, uh, the water being restored, I mean, many of those things went badly. I, there's no question about that. But to the point, did we, had we thought about those things, the answer is yes. Did they go well? The answer is no. Is there culpability to be found for the reasons why it didn't go well? Probably. We can go in and dive in there and sort of begin to separate why some of these things didn't work. Um, but, but I don't think it's fair to say that, that the thought hadn't been given to it and what the possible consequences might be. If you just thought it would be easier. Not easier. It wasn't so much that it was going to be easy. I, I don't think sitting in the, in the Secretary's office anybody ever thought it was going to be easy. Everybody, in fact, I think, thought it was going to be hard, and most of you remember the Secretary had that memo where he went through all the things that were going to go wrong, most of which, by the way, did. Right? Um, so it wasn't a case of thinking it was going to be easy. It's just that in the doing of it, it didn't get done in the way that people had intended for it to be done, which goes then to the, to the, uh, to the point which things in war don't usually go according to plan. Yeah, I could have some follow-ups, but I really want to get a couple more questions from the audience. Um, sir. Richard Friedman, National Strategy Forum. Uh, lesson learned for the future to be applied uh, before we consider invading Lichten, Lichtenstein or Luxembourg. Uh, red team, pushback. And there's a formula of at least 10 issues that could be applied before you make the decision to go or no go. And they're pretty much the obvious ones. And I wonder whether they had been applied, water over the dam in Iraq. But at least for the future, consider at least 10 of these things, which is a one size fits all matrix. Good manners applied to the neighbors. That would be the Turks and whether they're allow, they would have allowed us to bring the armored division in. Time, blood, money, preserving institutions, political vacuum, uh, U.S. domestic political reaction, and finally, uh, the regional powership if we get into a country. And so it just seems to me that those might be the elementary things, and I wonder whether or not there is any institutional red team pushback that can be applied to future activities and okay. maybe to avoid what we've had in Iraq. Of course, the CIA reformed how it looked at intelligence after this and established the red teaming process that helped with the Osama bin Laden raid to interrogate what intelligence they had before they decided to go with that. So was there a similar process at the DOD that you took away a lesson learned and... Well, not only took away lessons learned, I mean, that list of things was, uh, was uh, reviewed and, and thought about. And, uh, and as I say, I mean, uh, you know, the, it's usually said there was no plan for after the combat operations. 
My sense is that it's not so much there wasn't a plan. Um, I'm not sure the plans consolidated in the way that they might have. First, second, uh, I do think that list of the, the secretary's list I made mention to you just a moment ago has that in about 27 more things, right, of, of issues that one needs to think about uh, in undertaking those uh, things. So, yes, should there be some institutional basis for doing it? Yes, the joint staff, the guys here and others who've been on the joint staff, we, you know, exercises were done, uh, rehearsals were gone through. I mean, people thought about, about those things. Um, you know, war starts its own dynamic, right? And once that dynamic begins, it's all about managing it. And, and that falls to, to the three gentlemen here with the ambassadors on the ground in the country and the head of the military operation in the country, right? And they have to manage that dynamic once it's, it's let loose. I can want to get one more question from the audience. Um, let's see, um, sir. Uh, why don't we do that lightning round thing? I want to get like two I'll, questions. I'll be very brief. Okay. Uh, uh, Ambassador Hill, uh, my name is Bob Myers, and th I have a question as to whether uh, the those powers that decided to invade Iraq knew this fact that 80 to 90 percent of Sunni and Shia marry their first cousins. Was that a known fact? Because if you invade a country that where you're in, killing cousins, you create a lot of antagonism. That's an interesting question, and uh, one from over here, gentleman in the blue shirt. Uh, Tom Barron, I'm very interested in Dr. Hill's comments about uh, learning and how you uh, take experience and whether we could have done more of it here, and I'm thinking particularly, I'll use a small example. The leadership of the Army leading into this had just spent years in the former Yugoslavia what amounted to occupation operations. Like Ambassador, I spent several years in Vietnam, and there are relevant lessons there, but Shinseki and others had just spent years. Uh, and he got fired for, by Rumsfeld for suggesting it would take a much more significant force to do it. Uh, I use that small example to, to ask how, why, how, at the top level, can't we look um, more accurately at the pa recent past from lessons learned and carry them forward before going these kinds of directions? Gentlemen, so um, had we thought about the um, Sunni family structure and? Well, I can't say, uh, I mean, maybe other people can comment on whether we knew about uh, intermarriage at first cousin, but uh, I will say, you know, at the end of the Gulf War, it's often understood in the United States that we didn't march on Baghdad because the coalition would have broken up. And we always understood that without going too deeply into the analysis that the reason the coalition would have uh, broken up is that our, our Arab uh, uh, allies would not accept the idea of us going into still another country. It's one thing to liberate Kuwait, it's another thing to march into, into Iraq. And so the analysis stopped there. It might have been worthwhile to have a deeper look at why the Saudis would not have wanted us to overthrow a Sunni regime in Baghdad. And if we'd thought about why they wouldn't want us to overthrow a Sunni regime in Baghdad, i.e. it would become a Shia regime in Baghdad, and mind you, the Saudis wouldn't have believed us if we said, oh no, it'll be a coalition, there'll be some Shia and some Sunnis, and you know, everyone will live together. I don't think they'd buy that argument. So that's what was going on. It was one thing to kick this guy out of Kuwait. It was another thing to uh, flip Iraq to being a Shia country. And that's something we should have given a little more thought to, rather than just consider the Gulf War as some kind of unfinished business that, by golly, now that we've, we've been attacked in 9-11, we're going to finish it. So I think that was, a, uh, that was a serious failure of concept on our part. Jim. Yeah, if I could answer this, and to some degree, uh Get back to the, the question posed here. Most important thing, I think, uh, uh, despite all the things I said today that we've heard, was Steve Cambone saying, this is going to be a game changer. The impression I got when I got there and following this before was that uh, the decision in the Bush administration was largely, if we succeed in Iraq, taking this guy down and creating a democratic, friendly government, this is going to be a game changer and we got to try this. Uh, history has not had its final decision. 
it's still quite possible, and it really would be a very important step. But it's also quite possible that it won't after a tremendous cost. Had we gone to the American people and say, hey, do you feel lucky today? Let's roll the dice. This may involve a decade. This may involve tying up much of our diplomatic uh, uh, bandwidth. This may involve a trillion dollars. And maybe it'll work and it'll be a game changer. Maybe it won't. What do you think? And that was what all of these red teams and all of this other stuff would have produced was a lot of worries and such. This was not like going into Kuwait in 1991. That wasn't easy, required a lot of effort, but the outcome was pretty clear to see. There was nothing clear to see about this outcome. All of the problems that people identified emerged, and we've dealt more or less with most of them. So I would just leave it at... uh, If you decide that this is going to be a game changer, then you basically have to roll the dice. The question is, how do you bring the American people in on it? And yet we still have the Sunni-Shiite divide there and the Al-Qaeda presence that kicked off a civil war once before. So, But but you've got a government that's functioning. And and you have, in in its own way, right? Uh, I mean, I remember being there in 04 and all the parties being around the table. And this was a collection of folks who if they were on the street and running around, would have been picked up and arrested and put in detention, right? So they were all sitting there at the table talking to one another. They, they, knew, they know about one another and what they're doing. So the question is, do we give them the kind of support and help that it's going to take to get there? Which leads me to responding to the question about additional forces and back to my point about the approach, at least, that was in the Secretary's mind. And let me, despite my point about counterfactuals, uh, ask this question. Um, a short period of time in which the, the United States is the occupying power, by a period of, say, three to four years during which the United States is the occupying power. W- which of those would one want to choose? Right? So, so one of the things that one wants to think about as you're planning your, your campaign is how do you want to manage that outcome? And from the point of view of the department, a four-year, three, four-year occupation was not the, the, the choice that one wanted to plan against. That we ended up over a longer period of time in combat operations than we intended is true. And, and I've, I've said that, and we can go look and see why that would be the case. But as a strategic planning factor, do you want to plan? for a four-year occupation going in, or do you want to try to plan the thing in a way that you can minimize the time of occupation, speed the period in time in in which the the local people are able to take over the functions that are necessary to run the the country, and then move into the kind of uh, position we talked about earlier, which is lending the support and security and doing all those other kinds of things. That's an interesting question to take away from from our experience. Ambassador Negroponte, any final thoughts? TBD. I mean, I just don't think we can make the historical judgment at this point. It's our, our views are going to be influenced by the developments over the next uh, decade or so. That's my belief. Uh, I want to thank you for all taking part in this panel. Um, you answered some tough questions. And uh, thank you. We've, we've all lost friends in Iraq, and I think one of the important things is to try to take some of the emotion out of the debate and just really answer the question seriously, and I appreciate you all doing that today. Thank you you very much. Thank you.